Tom Reed's, what some might say, is the most famous verse in all scripture. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Probably the most famous verse in all of scripture. We're taught that we serve a loving, just God. A loving, just God. 1 John 4, 8. Three words. God is love. We serve a loving God. We serve a just God. Proverbs 8, verse 8. says, all the words that come from my mouth are just. We serve a loving, just God. What is... What does that mean? We serve a loving, just God. <clears throat> These last few weeks, Tom brilliantly preached on Philippians 4. He took two weeks to get through it, talking about don't be anxious about anything. But in prayer, with petition, give thanks, bring it to God. Last week, I followed up on that a little bit. Philippians 4, 7 talks about what? Peace. The peace that transcends understanding. We talked a lot about peace of mind this week at the center. So Tom took two weeks talking about fear, anxiousness. Last week I spoke on peace of mind. Today, I want to talk about how is it, what is it? What is one way that we can help hold on to that peace of mind in our lives? Prayer. Prayer is awesome. Always, always. Today I want to talk, though, <coughs> about a three-letter word that nobody likes. What's the word? Sin. Sin. Sin in our lives. I want to talk about the consequence of sin. Sin has its consequences in our lives. And for those of us, step seven, proof positive. Sin has its consequence, right guys? Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you, we love you. We call on your presence as we always do, Lord. We want you to be right at the center of this worship. We pray that it pleases you. I pray that this message pleases you. So I ask, Lord, that you would speak through me. We love you, Lord, and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that if we believe in him, we'll have eternal life. Unless you've never met him, you don't know who he is. <clears throat> and then he throws you into hell where you burn forever. Wrong. For God so loved the world <laughs> that he gave his only son so that you could have eternal life. Unless your theology doesn't quite match up to my theology. Mm. And then he throws you into hell where you burn forever. God so loves the world <laughs> that he gave his only begotten son. that you might have eternal life. Unless, on that day of judgment that we talk about, you're found just a little bit wanting. And then what's he do? Throw you in hell, or you burn bread. <clears throat> we 
We've been duped, my friends. Amen. Think of this little contrast here. What's maybe the most forgiving moment in all of Scripture? Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross. What does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You could paraphrase that. You could say, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't understand. Think about that. How would you like to have been one of the Roman soldiers who nails Jesus to the cross? I wonder if, if he heard Jesus say that, those guys standing at the foot of the cross. I don't know. Imagine, imagine what would happen in your heart if you were that soldier and you nailed him to the cross. And maybe you believe he is and maybe you don't. But the fact is, you hear him say, Father, forgive them. Then the big question is, do you think the Father forgave him? I mean, that's Jesus hanging on the cross. That's God hanging on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive me. I believe with all of my heart, I'm going to meet those guys in heaven. Jesus forgave me. Think of the 19-year-old teenager who, grew up, who grows up in the heart of the city. It's part of the gang doesn't have a father. Circumstances are brutal. He has a, a mother and two little sisters to take care of. He ends up making some pretty bad choices in his life. Ends up getting shot at the age of 19. Do we have the nerve to say that he was lost? I mean, he, did he just barely miss out? That's some scary stuff. When we talk a lot about that, and it can really get to me sometimes. I hear people, oh, well, I was saved uh, when I was 25 years old. May 1st happened at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Remember it like it was yesterday. I was saved. My friends, we were saved 2,000 years ago. Justice. Is eternal hellfire just? Does that sound just to you? The, the definition of, of just is, or justice is the quality of being just, fair or impartial. Now, I want to let you know, probably in the very near future, I'm going to preach a little series, maybe a three or four week series on the fires of hell. Not going to go there today. I'm just kind of planting a little seed for us today. But we serve, my friends, a loving, just God. We also need to know that there are consequences to the sin in our life. That's just natural. If we're living a sinful life, it's going to sneak up and bite you. We all know that. I don't like the word hate. In fact, I hate the word hate. I don't use it too often. But in this context, it's very appropriate. I hate sin. And Jesus hates sin. And why, why does Jesus hate sin? It's because he loves you. And he knows that the sin in your life is going to have its effect on you. It'll take you down if you're not careful. The word sin, it comes from a Greek word called homartia. <coughs> homartia, and it basically means to miss the mark. That's what sin means. It means to miss the mark. In Roman times, they used it in, in archery. If you missed the mark, it was called a sin. Sin has its consequences. Let's take a look at that. Turn to, turn to the Gospel of Luke. 
Luke 15. Luke 15 basically has three stories in it. Three stories that you could say all relate to something being lost. I would rather say they all relate to something being found. We start off with the lost sheep. We go from there to a lost coin. And then finally in Luke 15 we have the story of the prodigal son, the lost son. But I want to look today at the story of the lost sheep. Luke 15, I'm going to read in verse 1. Everybody there? It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Verse 3, Then Jesus told him this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need Wonderful story here. And it's not about sheep. It's about us, my friends. A couple things I want to point out. Who's the shepherd here? Jesus is the shepherd. 99 sheep over here. One of them's lost. How is it that this sheep, how is it that we are lost? We're lost, my friends, in our sin. That's how we get lost, is in our sin. So we have this lost sheep. And how does he get lost? One bite, one sin at a time. He's probably got his head down, he's eaten. Looks up all of a sudden, what happened here? One sin at a time. One drink. I can have one drink. Ever done that, guys? <laughs> Women? Notice what happens, though. What does Jesus do? He leaves all of them. How reassuring is that? He leaves all of them. To go find the one. And do you think if Jesus has the thought process that I need to go find the one, do you think he's going to be successful? I do. Great story. Turn to Isaiah 59. Turn to your left. I'm going to look at a little bit of scripture. Isaiah 59. And again, we're talking today about the consequences of sin in our lives. Isaiah 59. The consequence of sin in our lives. Look at this. It says, but your iniquities, you could substitute sin right there, but your sins <coughs> have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now this can sound a little harsh, but this isn't his choice. This isn't his choice, it's our choice. We talk a lot about it at step seven when, when I decide to take the bottle off the shelf or the pipe off the shelf. What do I do? Who do I put on the shelf? Jesus. That's my choice. Our sins have separated us from God. It's not His, it's not his will. It's, that's what we do. Turn to 2 Samuel, folks. Towards the front of the book. 
2 Samuel chapter 11. season of sin in his life. And he, he starts to feel the consequences of this. Last week we looked at we looked at the story that's right ahead of where we're going to read today. Today we're going to look at this, this sinful time that he had. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. I'll start 2 Samuel chapter 11 I'm going to start in verse 2. 2 Samuel 11, 2. It says, One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Keep your fingers right there. Notice the progression here. We, we see David. Going down a slippery slope. Starts off with what? With lust. He's up on his roof. He sees this woman, this beautiful woman, bathing. We talk about a lost lamb, one bite at a time, falling in to some fairly nasty sin here. Next thing we know, we go from lust what? We have adultery. Bring her here. He's the king. He can do what he wants. One bite at a time. Look at verse uh, We're going to start it. We're going to read verse 14. But first, I want to tell you a little bit. He sends for Uriah, King David. He sends for the husband who's on the front lines. He's off of war. Bathsheba's husband, his name is Uriah the Hittite. He's off at war. He sends for him. He says, bring him here. David tries to manipulate the situation here. He tries to get the husband to go home. Because perhaps maybe they'll have relations and he's off the hook then. But the guy won't do it. The next night, he even gets him drunk and tries him to get him to go home, but the guy says, you know, my, my brothers are, are, in, are at war right now. It wouldn't be right for me to go be with my wife. David's really trying to manipulate the scene here. Finally, he sees no other way out of this situation. He's got him. And look at verse 14. He says, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. This is disgusting. This is King David, a man that Acts chapter 13 says is a man after God's own heart. Huh, Tom? This is disgusting. He writes a letter, seals it up, gives it to the guy. Basically, here's your death certificate. Go take it to your commander, Joab. Lust, adultery, now what? Murder. We've got murder here. One bite at a time. Let's read... Uh, Jump over to Jump over to chapter 12. <coughs> I'm going to read quite a bit here. 
Verse 1. The Lord sends this prophet by the name of Nathan to go see David. Verse 1 starts. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town. One rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and grew it up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Verse 5, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Keep your fingers there. Nathan is sent to King David, and he uses this little story here to convict him of what he's done. What happens to David here? He gets really angry. What does he call for? He calls for justice. He wants to kill him, but at the very least he said he needs to pay four times over for what he's done. Let's move on. Verse uh, 7. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you, and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Keep your fingers there. The consequences are starting to come down the road here. This, this little prophecy from Nathan fulfills itself. David was a warrior his whole life. His son, who rebelled against him just a little further, fills the part of this other prophecy of being with his wives. The consequences are starting to happen. There is consequence, my friends, for the sin in our lives. Let's not ever forget that. But let's move on here. Look at verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die, but because by doing this you have made the enemies, the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. So we see here, David instantly repents. The story nails him right between the eyes. He repents. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. Notice the beautiful statement that we hear next. 
Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. The Lord forgives us, my friends. But we need to repent of the sin in our lives. He's not going to take the consequences away. Keep going your way. And you're going to have consequences. Give it to the Lord. We see a wonderful story here. David repents instantly. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan says, the Lord has taken away your sin. Jesus hangs on the cross and says, Father, forgive them. They don't get it. They don't understand. I want to finish in 1 Peter. First Peter chapter one. Verse thirteen is where we're gonna start. He's got a page number. What's that, Mike? Eight fifty. First Peter chapter one. And I don't want to finish here on some legalistic high and mighty throne here. But my friends, we need to search our hearts. We need to discover what is it in my life that maybe I'm missing the mark. And we need to repent as David did. We need to look to Christ and say he's the standard. I want to be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. I want to be more like him tomorrow than I am today. And he tells us. What's it say about verse 13? Be holy. Be holy. <clears throat> Let me read verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Wow, that's a good one for step seven. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. There's our standard. And it's a perfect standard. Jesus calls us out to be holy. He's actually quoting Leviticus here quite a bit back in the, in the law. But he says, be holy. Friends, there are consequences for the sin in our lives, and Jesus can't stand that. <clears throat> That's why he hates sin so much. He's told us how to live our lives. And in living our lives the way he tells us to live our lives, he knows that we'll be joyful. I want to ask you today, do you ever feel, do you ever feel like you're one of those lost sheep? And if you do, please know today that Jesus longs to find you. And what Jesus longs for, I believe he succeeds at. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you, we love you. Lord, I pray that you help us all today to search our hearts, to weed out the sin in our lives, because we know that it breaks your heart to see us acting stupid down here. Lord, and it warms your heart to see us growing closer to you on a daily basis. So Lord, as David did here, help us to search our hearts, help us to repent, and to grow closer and closer to you on a daily basis. And we just love you, Lord, and we thank you for all your blessings. And as we always do, we, we lift up our prayers in that precious, Precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Amen. Amen.